Washburn University celebrated its sesquicentennial in 2015, 150 years. But we couldn't have reached this milestone without the hard work and commitment of many people throughout the years. Washburn University was originally known as Lincoln College and was founded by members of the Congregational Church. Those members had come to Kansas Territory from New England and were very committed to the cause of keeping slavery out of Kansas. They believed that one of the best ways to achieve that was through education. Congregationalists actually hail from the Mayflower Pilgrims. They were very concerned with the Word of God and knew that to study the scriptures, one must learn how to read. So education was very important. In fact, only 16 years after landing at Plymouth, the Pilgrims established Harvard, America's first college. They were just as action-oriented as they were spiritual people. In 1854, when the Kansas-Nebraska Act opened up the territory for settlement, it allowed voters to choose whether Kansas would join the Union as a free state or slave state. This new concept known as popular sovereignty caused both pro-slavery supporters and free state supporters or abolitionists to pour into Kansas. Both sides hoped to gain the political majority needed to define the future of Kansas. The center of the abolitionist movement in America was found in the New England states. In the towns and villages in New England, an activist brand, a very powerful brand of evangelical Christianity developed. Believers felt they had a responsibility to crusade against all sin. Slavery was defined as a sin, therefore slavery must be prevented from taking shape in the state of Kansas. Those evangelical beliefs and ideals of Congregationalists and Abolitionists played a key role in shaping the civil, political, and religious life, as well as educational life in the state of Kansas. To help the cause, those who stayed in New England formed anti-slavery and emigrant aid societies throughout the North. They sponsored lectures, published abolitionist literature, drafted and signed legislative petitions, and raised money. Churches urged their congregations to send aid to the free state settlers in Kansas. The Congregational Churches of New England began sending ministers to Kansas Territory by way of the New England Emigrant Aid Company of Massachusetts. The first minister, Reverend Samuel Lum, arrived in 1854 and started a church in the new town of Lawrence. The New England Emigrant Aid Company was instrumental in establishing other towns that also became important centers of free state activities, as well as sites of pioneer congregational churches, such as Topeka, Osawatomie, Manhattan, and Wabansi. At their first meeting in 1857, the Association of Congregational Ministers and Churches of Kansas made two resolutions. They condemned slavery and vowed to build a Christian college on the Kansas prairie. In order to accomplish this, they often looked to their New England friends for help. Help came in a variety of ways, including ready money. In fact, it was a visit to Uncle Tom's cabin author, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and her sisters that resulted in a donation that made it possible to purchase the 160 acres on which the college now stands. Her brother, Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, also helped the cause with his now famous Beecher Bibles and Rifles. The Congregationalists met with many obstacles as they worked to establish a college, including Missouri-Kansas border clashes, drought, finding a town that was able to sustain a college, and of course, the Civil War. After struggling for almost a decade, the Kansas Congregationalist dream finally came true. On February 6th, 1865, college trustees drew up articles of association and named the school Lincoln College. The college was dedicated to the triumph of liberty over slavery and grounded in the belief that education should be available to all. In keeping with their beliefs, Lincoln College welcomed all students, regardless of race or gender. 
The first preparatory class enrolled 38 students, including women and one African American. However, the Congregationalists' troubles were far from over. The post-Civil War economy was not conducive to raising local money, and persistent financial problems plagued the struggling college. Frequent trips were made back east to raise funds. In 1868, nearly on the brink of closing the college, the trustees sent Professor Horatio Butterfield to New England to seek donations. Reverend Butterfield ended up in Worcester, Massachusetts. On advice of a friend, he went to visit Ichabod Washburn, a very wealthy industrialist and a deacon in the Congregational Church. Washburn had developed an enormously successful wire manufacturing company and was well known for his philanthropy. Ichabod Washburn was a strong believer in the value of education. It also had an interest in programs which empowered women and the poor. He became interested in the college on the Kansas Prairie and pledged $25,000. His gift essentially kept the college from having to close its doors. In appreciation of this generous donation, the Lincoln College trustees soon voted to change the school's name to Washburn College. A few weeks later, Washburn died from complications of a stroke, having never set foot on Kansas soil. Ichabod Washburn was born on August 11, 1798 in Kingston, Massachusetts. Both of his parents were direct descendants of Mayflower Pilgrims, his mother Sylvia descending from Governor William Bradford of the Plymouth Colony. Ichabod's father, Ichabod Washburn Sr., was a young sea captain and intended to raise his son to be a seafarer as well. However, just two months after the birth of Ichabod and his twin brother Charles, their father died of yellow fever, leaving their mother to care for the infant boys and their four-year-old sister, Pamelia. To support her family, Sylvia Washburn spun yarn and worked as a weaver. Ichabod said that his first mechanical labor was to wind the quills for his mother's loom. Sylvia also taught her children the scriptures, something that Ichabod took to heart for the remainder of his life. Eventually, Sylvia found it difficult to make a living for her family and decided it was necessary to put young Ichabod out to work at the age of nine. He went to a nearby town to apprentice with a harness and trunk maker and worked there for five years. His twin brother Charles, who was said to have been born without a right arm, was allowed to go to school since it was difficult for him to do physical labor. Being away from home at such a young age, Ichabod missed his family greatly. His mother had given him a Bible and he found comfort in reading it and in going to church. To help fight his loneliness, he wrote letters home to his mother and his siblings. Ichabod also loved to go to school and he would attend whenever possible, usually just a few weeks in the winter when his master would allow it. When his first apprenticeship ended, he returned to Kingston to work in a cotton factory and eventually operated a power loom. This sparked his great interest in machinery. Ichabod's last two apprenticeships were in the blacksmith trade. He really excelled at this and it became the foundation of his later success. His last apprenticeship ended in 1818. By that time he was 20 years old and was living near Worcester and free to do pretty much what he pleased. He started his first business manufacturing plows. For startup costs he had to borrow money so he went to a wealthy man in Worcester and asked for a loan. To his surprise the man loaned him the money. To obtain equipment for his business, Ichabod visited another prosperous businessman who was living nearby. Washburn discovered that the wealthy man had donated money to build a church, support a minister, and maintain a Sabbath school. Always remembering his religious upbringing, in Ichabod's eyes this man's success seemed to illustrate the scripture that taught that godliness is profitable unto all things. The wealthy man made an impression on young Ichabod and likely influenced Washburn's future benevolence. After his success with the plow business, Ichabod continued to work at jobs, which gave him more experience with machinery. In 1820, he bought a business which manufactured lead pipe. 
It was about this time that Washburn made his first charitable donation. He was hesitant at first, but a friend encouraged him to go ahead and give, telling him that he would soon see the donation come back to him. Washburn gave 50 cents, and not long afterwards he received a very large order for lead pipe. To Ichabod, these two events seemed strongly connected. From that time on, he continued to give and claimed that he never lacked for work. In 1822, Washburn expanded his business and took on a partner, forming the firm of Washburn and Goddard. They manufactured machinery for woolen mills, wood screws, and wire. During the partnership, Washburn developed a wire drawing machine and a technique which not only improved the quality of wire, but also greatly increased the efficiency of production. Ultimately, this innovation would lead to Washburn's financial success. Eventually, Washburn and Goddard ended their partnership, and Washburn continued the business of manufacturing wire, having moved to the Grove Street location. Business continued to increase, and in 1842, Ichabod's brother Charles, now an attorney, came into the business. In 1850, Washburn's son-in-law, Philip Moen, became a partner, giving the firm its well-known name of Washburn and Moab. Washburn and Moen became the nation's largest manufacturer of wire. Up until that time, most wire had to be imported from England. Washburn's innovations in wire production made his business a leader in the production of wire for hoop skirts and pianos, as well as the extensive demand for telegraph wire. After Ichabod Washburn's death, his business became a forerunner in the manufacture of yet another new product in great demand, barbed wire. Washburn and Moen laid the foundation of what would become one of the largest manufacturing plants in America, and eventually part of what is now known as the U.S. Steel Corporation. But Ichabod Washburn was not only building his business, he was building a legacy as a philanthropist. He believed that Christian activity should not be confined to church, but should be extended to the community. Washburn started a Sabbath school for African-American children and a Sabbath school at the county prison, as well as another in his home. He then built and provided funds to support Mission Chapel for those in the poor neighborhoods of East Worcester. He had supported both the Church Anti-Slavery Society and Freedmen's Aid Society and was a leader of a Massachusetts petition urging the United States Congress to emancipate slaves. Ichabod Washburn was one of the founders of the Worcester Polytechnic Institute. He was adamant about the importance of adding mechanical science to theory training, so he built a large machine shop and furnished it with a steam engine and machinery. The Washburn shops continue to be a training site for students today. Washburn also originated the idea of building Mechanics Hall in Worcester and was a principal donor. Today the hall is still considered one of the finest concert halls in the world with superb acoustics. Ichabod Washburn became a champion of programs who helped women. He gave money to build the Memorial Hospital in Worcester in memory of his two young daughters, Pamelia and Eliza both of whom died within the two-year period of 1853 to 1854. The bereaved Washburn would also lose his wife, Anne, and his only grandchild, Annie, by 1856. In 1859, Washburn wed his second wife, Elizabeth. In his will, Washburn gave an endowment for a home for aged women and willed his own residence to be used for that purpose. Originally, it was intended for the care of indigent widows of Civil War veterans. More recently, this institution has been known as the Ichabod Washburn Hospice Residence. Since 1870, the Ichabod Washburn Benevolent Fund has helped unmarried women in Kingston who are in need of assistance. Currently, the fund goes towards help with home heating costs. Grounded in his religious beliefs and philanthropic ideals, Ichabod Washburn responded to Reverend Butterfield's request to come to the aid of a single building college on the Kansas Prairie, a college which was dedicated to freedom and equality, born out of our nation's greatest conflict, and admitted students regardless of race or gender. Lincoln College upheld the New England Puritan values that Ichabod Washburn shared. New England philanthropy continued to contribute greatly to the early Washburn campus. 
Buildings such as Hartford College, Holbrook Hall, Boswell Library, McVicker Chapel, and Crane Observatory were all built with the help of New England donors who shared a belief in liberty and in education. Ichabod Washburn, the namesake of Washburn University, truly personified the New England spirit and values that not only established this college, but also helped settle Kansas as a free state. Washburn's legacy lives on, not only in his home state of Massachusetts, but also at the university on the Kansas prairie that bears his name, and in the thousands of alumni who call themselves Ichabods. This project is funded, in part, by the Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area.